There's a story to be told, a future to behold. There is more to who we are than what they hear. We have love within our soul, fire in our bones. We've got everything it takes to make it here. There's much more within our soil, more than just our oil. We can grow the food to feed the whole world square. Agriculture is the key, there's treasure in the trees. The time is now, the land is green, wealth is here. The Business of Agriculture Masterclass is back, and this time, it's all about you. We understand how talk can look easy but become daunting with practice, and that is exactly our focus for this year. Agric in practice. Three days, nine sessions, 20 plus speakers, eight value chains. Join Agric experts from September 27th to 29th, 2022, as they discuss the best practices for maximum results in your agric venture answer critical questions about the specific challenges you face, and teach you how to tackle those challenges to achieve more profit for your business. What's more amazing? The Masterclass is free and virtual, so you can join from wherever you are. All sessions will be streamed live on Facebook and YouTube. Visit www.businessofagriculture.org to register for the Business of Agriculture Masterclass today. This is brought to you by the Private Sector Advisory Group of the UNSDG Fund. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session of the Business of Agriculture Masterclass 2.0, where we'll be discussing the practice of agro-logistics and trade. My name is Damlari Olanio, and I will be your moderator for this session. Trade plays a crucial role in providing livelihoods for farmers and people employed along the food supply chain. It also contributes to reducing food insecurity across the globe and provides greater choice in consumer goods. Trade in agri-food products has grown strongly over the last two decades, reaching almost 7% in real terms 
annually between 2001 and 2019. But agri-food trade isn't just increasing, it's becoming global. A growing share of agri-food trade is taking place in global value chains. Agricultural and food processing value chains that are spread over several countries, linking agri-food sectors and other sectors of the economy from across the world. The COVID-19 pandemic led to trade disruptions worldwide, but the agricultural and food sector proved to be more resilient than other sectors of the economy. During the first months of the pandemic, price hikes in staple crops were avoided thanks to transparency in market conditions and policies. Rapid responses by policymakers and the private sector managed to prevent severe disruptions in agri-food trade, including global seed markets. However, bottlenecks in transport and logistics complicated moving agricultural and food products around the world and resulted in increased costs of shipping and transport. In this session, agro-logistics and trade experts will dig deep into their world of experience and provide the audience with detailed context on the best practices or strategies to employ to become successful in, their, in this value chain and to overcome the challenges faced in the value chain. We'll go on a short break. And when we are back, we'll go deeper into this session. Welcome back. I hope your expectations are high because we're just getting started. We have a number of experts with us today to analyze our, the agro-logistics value chain in Nigeria and how to overcome challenges in it. Our first panelist today is Mr. Bamidele Ayumibo. He is the head consultant of 3T Impex Consulting Limited. You're welcome, Mr. Bamidele. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Our next panelist this morning is Mr. Femin Boyede. Mr. Femin Boyede is the CEO of Coinonia Global Services. You're welcome, Mr. Femin. Thank you so much for inviting me. All right. Thank you very much. All right. I'm excited to see you. Our panelists, they are all stood up to share their insights, right, in the uh, agricultural uh, logistics and value chain. So before we commence, I'd like us to go on another short break. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back. Welcome back. I'm excited. I'd like to mention that we have questions, right, regarding choosing the best practices for agrologistics, the common challenges faced in the value chain, and how to overcome these challenges. And we're going to start from the area of finance. I'm going to be directing my question. All right. Are we there? Okay, great. So we're going to start with the area of finance. I'm going to direct my question to Mr. Silent, Mr. Bamdele. So Mr. Bamdele, I'm going to ask this. What's the best technique or strategy, right? Before we go into that, I'd like to also to have like a brief overview, right, of the uh, the logistics landscape, right, culture in Nigeria, right? Many people believe, there are a lot of misconceptions, right? A lot of opinions cycling around when it comes to logistics in agriculture in uh, in Nigeria uh because we have a lot of you know food spoilage we have a lot of agriculture not reaching the markets not you know from 
our own value chain today that because of the logistics issues we have. But well, this is actually true. There are actually challenges and uh, logistics in, in Nigeria. And what are these challenges? Let's start with that. Well, there are challenges with logistics in Nigeria. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why our product is expensive is because we don't have efficient logistic in place, place to be able to move goods out of the country. So, for example, uh, you want to move goods out of the country, you have to haul by road, sometimes all the way from Kano to Lagos, and you're going to be incurring a lot of cost doing that. Uh, whereas in another environment, it's going to go by rail, and by rail, it will be costing as low as maybe 20 or 30 percent of what you incur if you are going by road uh, for such a product. And at the end of the day, it just makes it difficult for you in terms of competition. If you are selling, and it's important we understand we are selling to international market. What that means is that if you are going to be selling to other countries that have efficient transport system, that means you might not be competitive. Uh, so this is a big challenge, and of course, the issue of spoilage you mentioned is very, very big. Uh, because if you're exporting commodities, uh, agro commodities that is not processed, which is why I always recommend you consider process. But the commodity that is not processed, the implication of that is things can go bad in transit. I mean, you ship good from Kano to Lagos, from Kogi to Lagos, and while the good is in transit, you have issue of traffic, delay. I mean, recently, Lagos, Long Bridge, people were there for almost 24 hours because of traffic. If you have that kind of stuff, you have goods in container under the sun, being heated up. Of course, you expect those kind of people to have issues, to get spoiled. So if we're going to really solve that problem, we might need to begin to maximize the opportunity of rail to be able to goose on road across the country rather than going uh, by road. So the logistic challenge is real, but the beauty is, in spite of the challenges, I always try to also look at the good side. People have found a way to do this among these challenges. So, for example, if I'm going to export perishables like um, vegetable, I know that if I'm going to export vegetable from Nigeria, number one, it has to go by air. Number two, you probably have to get a cold storage system. For those that do that kind of transaction, they will have to wake up very early to harvest to ensure that product gets into uh, the terminal at the airport before it's 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. to be able to ensure that uh, the sun is not uh, right up on, upon the product to make it to get uh, spoiled. So what I'm going to say in essence is that in spite of the challenges, I mean, Nigerian businessmen to a large extent have been able to find ways around this problem to minimize the impact of those challenges as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abamdeli. Thank you for giving us that overview. Now, I'd like to direct... You can see Mr. Isouf Ogumbi is there. Good to have you here, sir. Yeah, good morning. Pardon me, I'm actually joining from a warehouse. Um, okay. So, you would pardon the background. Well, that's fine. I think we are discussing logistics, so it's good. I think you, you picked the perfect location for this <laughs> session. So Mr. Isu Ogumbi is the head of product structuring and origination for Apex Commodities Exchange. So you're welcome once again. Now I'd like to direct my next question to Mr. Olufemi. Mr. Olufemi, now we've talked now, Mr. Bamdele has made us uh, brought to our awareness the challenges we have in logistics in Nigeria. Now, what can't we just manage, right? What is the implication? Why should we address this question? Why should we address the, you know, the subject matter of logistics uh, as as uh, agriculture in Nigeria? So why is it something we should talk about? Can't we just manage? What are the implications? Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. There is hardly any agricultural commodity that Nigeria is exporting, of which Nigeria is the only producer. That means that. Nigeria is in competition. And that word is very critical when you are in international trade domain. Competitiveness, ability to stand at par or outcompete uh, people who have um, similar products. And of course, the ingredients that go into uh, competitiveness cut across the entire logistics value chain. Let me start in addition to what uh, Mr. Amigo has said. If we're looking at agricultural commodities, before you get to wanting to transport uh, either by road or by rail, what happens at the farm gate? 
Nigeria has been shouting, clamoring, uh, hyping the need for value added export. Do we have farm gate processing? Do we have any infrastructure to support uh, the primary handling of the goods even before they get into whether it is the trailer or the uh, uh, train? My honest answer as of today is no. What are the handling practices, some of which actually uh, result in the rejection of our products? A, a cocoa farmer sees weevil or cockroach, and he thinks that the best way to get that product uh, to uh, a papa is to first and foremost, um, let's use a good word, fumigate the container. Who is responsible for the choice of chemical that is used in fumigating the container? You want to ship a waoloi to Europe or to America. And uh, by the time it gets there, the first test shows that it is not fit for human consumption because it has been contaminated by the chemical that was used to fumigate or to bring it into that market. So there is a concern that as of today, Nigeria's trade infrastructure is either inadequate or actually in some cases completely zero. We have commodity warehouses. Thank God Mr. Ogumbi is here. About 20 years ago, when I was still export manager of uh, Stanmark Cocoa Processing, the only ones available were SGS and um, I've forgotten CSS. Yeah, CSS in uh, uh, what's the name of that uh, market? Uh, Long Upper Power Show, the expressway. Those were the only two that everybody was coming to. As of today, currently, if you want to do pre export shipment, I don't even want to go to the area of the port congestions. But Mr. Bamdele Ayemibo is aware of a challenge I faced about two years ago when I needed to ship a 40 foot container of Nigerian foods to uh, Canada. First, we couldn't find a, a location around the port where all these things could be aggregated and uh, packaged. It took ages. And by the time that we got this, uh, uh, we were able to get, we had to pay through our noses. And as near, just 300 meters to the port, as near as our loading bay was to the port, it took us one and a half months or thereabout before the uh, container was able to get into the port. These are challenges. And like I said, if you are competing with other countries, the consumer is not going to wait for Nigeria's uh, uh, okra to arrive. And that reminds me, another one that you mentioned, uh, Damilari, if you, had, uh, if you ever visited the Narco Shed, we have comparative advantage in the export of fresh vegetables. If you went to Narco Shed, every day you will see them packing ugu, utazi, okra, and other fresh vegetables, mostly headed for Austria or the Netherlands. If any consumer sees the way that these are being handled in the Narco Shed, it will never come to Nigeria again. These people have not been taught about product presentation. So you see the trucks arrive from Shagamu or from Aba, especially those bringing ugu leaves and uka, uh, is it otazi they come overnight and they come with the leaves fresh like that sandy and everything i know this because as um, the uh, convener of export digest television program i did a documentary where the officials at naco actually beat my cameraman to stupor for daring to come and capture what was going on. But the truth is, 
there is a big need. There's a very huge need, even for as little as pre-export handling as part of the logistics value chain. There's a big gap out there. And um, yes, we are all um, educated, we are erudite, we are elite. We talk day in and night out about uh, uh, gap. We talk about certification. Without certification without proper handling is not getting us anywhere. So there is quite a number, a huge number of challenges that need to be addressed. Export readiness can be taught in the classroom. What happens at the farm gate is not what uh, you come and learn in theory. It's something that has to be practiced. What happens at Naco Shed, and of course, if there are any other airports where uh, products are living uh, out of Nigeria, remember, these products are flying the flag of Nigeria. And again, to round up, like I said, it is not only Nigeria that produces this. So if you went into a grocery shop anywhere in Europe or America, and you saw the presentation of bananas from the Philippines compared with the injured and battered bananas that come from Nigeria, of course, you are the consumer. The presentation of the product is the first attraction that helps you to make the decision to buy. Let me stop here for the time being. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Olpembeide. Uh, you really touch a number of things. Touched uh, product presentation, you know, touch uh, the challenges space, the production, and a lot of things. So let's direct the next question to Mr. Isu, right? Mr. Isu, you're joining us from the uh, the warehouse there. So this is the same vein that uh, Mr. Alpemi you know started. I like to just ask this question, right? Because I remember he mentioned that at uh, some point his cameraman was beaten to stupor. So, what are the the most common and demeaning challenges, right? You have faced in your business journey in the Nigerian agricultural ecosystem, as regards logistics and exports, and how do you overcome these challenges? Yeah. Um... Good morning, everyone. I guess the other speakers have mentioned some of the challenges you typically face, whether it's the in-country challenges surrounding access and um, affordability of logistics itself. Um, before you can even think of being able to pay for the logistics, do you even have access to it? Um, there's, a, there's a severe shortage of um, availability in that space. Um, then secondly, just because the forces of demand and supply will always play into um, the price, um, the cost of logistics will typically go up. And um, we see that logistics in Nigeria is highly inefficient. So you typically have your, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Damila, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, you typically have your 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 cargo spending almost the same time it spends between probably Nigeria and Netherlands and spending almost the same time within the country in some instances. Um, if you look at the distance between Nigeria and Netherlands and the distance between probably Lagos and Kaduna, Kano and thereabouts, you, you then wonder why we are we are this inefficient. But thinking about solutions, right, there are a few elements that we have seen that are quite helpful, um, especially when you think of these, these challenges from a business standpoint. To be honest, I'm not sure to what extent the government can come in in providing solutions to these things. Some of them are actually purely government um, interventions that would solve it. So whether you're looking at the port or the airport itself, the seaport or the airport, these are primarily government-owned entities or government-run entities, and they have the prerogative to provide solutions in that space. But even before, beyond that, right, we are looking at interactions with farmers, last mile, last mile interactions with farmers, and you will see that um, when businesses design solutions that have this engagement at the very 
bottom of the chain or the end of the chain, basically, you are able to mitigate some of these challenges. Again, if you look at these solution, these challenges from a long-term standpoint, so as a business, you are looking at solutions that would provide, um, you are looking at partners. You have to be collaborative as well. So you are looking at partners that will provide solutions for you or that can join you on this journey over the long term, not necessarily transactional partners that just want to move cargo every now and then. You are looking at someone that is also interested in building a long-term capability in the logistics business, and you are able to develop relationships with those kind of people. That way, you are able to mitigate some other risks that you are exposed to. Um, some other risks as well such as pricing and volatility that comes with the pricing. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody has been able to um, resolve that completely. We are all still exposed to it, so we still try to manage and um, overcome these challenges in the very minimal way we can. So for me, uh, first of all, it, there is collab collaboration is super critical here. Whether you are looking at it with, uh, uh, you are looking at it from the perspective of collaborating with um, the logistics providers, or you are looking at it from the perspective of collaborating with the farmers at the last mile area. Um, also, we we can't shy away from the fact that engagement with the government can never be uh, overemphasized. We still need to continue to do it every now and then, so that some of this infrastructure um, is provided. And lastly, you look for partners that are long-term focused, not necessarily one-time contract-based partners that will just come in and breeze out at every point in time. So you look at people that will typically provide you solutions on a long-term basis. Um, I guess that way you can mitigate some of these challenges. But then, above all, you like um, Mr. Olufemi has said, um, you are competing with people across the world. You are competing with people even within the country, so logistics within the country as well. So if you don't figure out solutions to your problems, um, I guess we we'll just have to say um, we, we don't have a business doing that business in that instance. So, but then um, as long as the business exists, we need to continue to provide those solutions. Um, so that's what I just have to say. Thank wow. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yusuf Ogumbi. Thank you. Now, my next question goes to Mr. Bamdele uh, Imbo. All right, okay, so now that's good. So we have a question from, from the audience from YouTube. Uh, this is from, okay, I think I'll address question later. So my next question goes to Mr. Bamdele. And I remember uh, Mr. Alufemi, but they touched on branding and uh, on branding earlier on. Uh, he was talking about a product presentation how uh, if you see a product like let's say banana like uh, you mentioned uh, uh presented by the philippines and see the ones presented by nigerians you yeah, you're forced to uh, say okay what is this you no know, it is like battered right so now so i do so how does one right effectively brand and network right is business in the agro logistic and and trade uh, industry right to become a, a market leader i hope that question is clear so how does one really effectively brand, right, and package, you know, your business in the agro-logistics and trade industry to become a market leader? Um, first of all, in as much as um, container is necessary, I think the content is very critical because if you make it very attractive and people buy and then they tasted it and the quality is bad, they will buy again. So the container attract them to buy, but the content keep them to continue to buy. The container, by container now I mean the, the, the design, the logo, whatever it is that you have around it, the largest thing is going to attract whoever is going to buy the product. But that also should be done in such a way that it's providing adequate information. I'm hearing a lot of background. I don't know where it's coming from. Providing adequate information for whoever is buying the product. You know, 
For example, if I'm going to be selling my product to maybe francophone country, and it's already labeled in English, I it will be very important for me to find a way to begin to label in French to be able to have access in that market. Now, to become a global brand will take a while, in the sense that it's not going to happen overnight. But more importantly, is that such an individual also must be ready to spend a lot of money on promotion, which is where I think the government comes in because of the amount of resources required to make that happen. You know, someone was saying that a number of our food have not been able to scale because we are not working with major chefs around the world who do program on CNN, Sky News, and all this, uh, Abizira, all these big media that are cut across different countries to be able to also learn and prepare our meal using our food. So that because a lot of people listen to them, watch them from around the world, it becomes easier for them to be able to try out our product. But that's uh, majorly on the, on the food side. But generally, my opinion on being able to scale it is, or to become a global brand is, that the product is not just attractive, you're not just promoting for people to be able to know about it, but by the time they experience the product, the experience keeps them coming. And this is happening among other things. The other things that have been mentioned earlier around competition, other things that have been mentioned earlier around availability. You know, we were talking to someone in Europe the other time about getting some Nigerian product, and the concern of the buyer was not just about the initial shipment. You know the initial shipment will likely happen. His concern was subsequent shipment. Now look, after this first shipment, if I need to be ship again, how soon will it be done? And he said his experience with some Nigerian uh, producer, these are value-added products, is that after being the first tranche the first shipment, subsequent shipment sometimes become a challenge. Because the subsequent shipment, if the product is good, most likely will be with a higher demand. And because the business have not anticipated that and built capacity, it then becomes very difficult for the business to be able to meet up with such demand. So, which is where my idea of the of the concept of readiness coming is if I'm going to go global and I'm going to be able to scale and be a global brand, like you said, I should also be ready to take on the demand when it comes. Because if the product is good and I'm introducing it to the market, and people are embracing it, of course they are going to come with a higher demand. And when that happens, I shouldn't be saying, oh, give me more time to be able to produce. I should have put process in place to be able to ensure I'm able to deliver within the shorter possible time to the market to be able to ensure that the people buying from me do not have the space they are giving their shelf empty. At the critical moment, and people are now coming and saying, we want this product and they are not able to find it because this person has been able to do initial shipment, but subsequent shipment now is a challenge, which is where the issue of financing then becomes very, very important. You should have a situation in which you have a line bank to be able to ensure you can draw on that line to produce a larger volume if the demand happens, not waiting for that demand to happen before you uh, begin to. Because you see a situation in which individuals have done a shipment, now there is a demand, and it is after that demand that is now going to bank to source for funds. Whereas it would have been good if such an individual or company have a line with the bank already, so that when the demand comes, you are able to draw on the line. Or, I mean, this is also where probably government will come to be able to support. But I'm basically saying that in as much as you need a good design that is communicating the right information, that is, pro I mean, uh, packaging, that is protecting the content, that is marketing the goods, that is keeping the good in the right shape uh, and form for a very long time before it expires, you also must ensure that the content of the product is good enough. You know what I discovered? Even if you now begin to increase your price, which is why some businesses will come into the market, they will come into the market at the initial stage and reduce their prices. To be able to enter the market and after a while start increasing the price. Now, if the quality is good, the co container have attracted them, they've tasted the product, the quality is good now, they are coming to buy and buy again. If
Can you hear me, please? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So if the quality is good, you can actually increase your price gradually at the end of the day. Why? Because, I mean, competition is critical in international trade. It's a big challenge for us because we have a, a heavy infrastructural deficit that has increased the cost of doing business in our environment. But what I discover is, because it happened to me in a, for a shipment we do to the UK for PAP, the product price eventually increased and people were willing to buy. Why were they willing to buy? They were willing to buy because they are used to the product, they want the product, a slight increase, they can adjust to it. But the reason why they did that is because the content is okay. So branding is good, it's important because it attracts people to your product, but I'm also very, I also think it's very important that you also ensure the quality of the content of the product. It's not just good, it's also maintained to keep the customer coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bamdele. Thank you very much. Now, next on, we'll be addressing finance. But before we do that, let's go on a short break. <laughs> All right, so, so I'd like to address this question to Mr. Olufemi Boyede. I know you have vast experience in sports management. So my question is this, right? Which markets in the agro-logistics and trade sector have the highest opportunity to make the maximum profit? Because we are here to discuss money. <laughs> so which markets, right, in the agro-logistics and trade sector have the highest opportunity, right, to make the maximum profit? Um, um, I don't want to, to play to the gallery, but I would, um, if you don't mind, damn Larry, if you don't mind, I will say that that is a question that consultants, export consultants get, I mean, here like 50 times a day. And I think that that is the laziest approach to this matter. So you are looking for which product has the highest uh, profit? No, every product, every agricultural commodity, depending on your com compliance with what uh, Bamidele has just listed, has the potential. What are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, 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 pricing potential in terms of price volumes or in terms of profit margin? Let me illustrate. A ton of cocoa probably goes for 4,000 pounds. By the time you do the logistics and everything, your maximum profit margin, quote me, maximum profit margin, I'm sure uh, FX knows uh, much more about this, thing, will be 5%. If you are lucky, 6%. That's the maximum. Now, compare the capital outlay. But if I get my uh, acts right and I decide it is coolie coolie, I'm going to export. And my coolie coolie. I can hear him. Is it from my yeah. end or from. Okay. I think we lost him a bit there. Eh? Okay, I think you can just go in a short break while you reconnect. Okay, so while we wait to our, our panelists back, I'd like to direct this question to Mr. Bamdeli. Uh, yes, I actually wanted to. Uh, I love the way Mr. Boy started. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, good. I love the way he started to respond to that question. It's a lazy approach, sincerely. I was thinking you were going to ask questions on finance, but that means we have not gotten into finance yet. Yeah. It's a lazy approach, sincerely. Um, every product has potential, depending on the market you're looking at. I mean, there are different markets that you can consider. I think he's back. Yes, he is. I, I hope I'm back. Yes, you are. Yes. Okay, I got kicked out. I don't know whether it's the kuli kuli or the cocoa. <laughs> people got angry. But okay, 
Uh, thanks for, uh, 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 let me continue the trend. Kuli Kuli, well packaged, tasty, not too much pepper, not too much salt, uh, uh, packaging attractive, and you get to the shelf. If I buy one kilogram of Kuli Kuli at $10, equivalent in Naira, add all costs and everything, and I get to an American uh, market, and I'm selling it at $18, just to be uh, uh, conservative. I'm making $8 per every $10. So which is more profitable? Is it cocoa or kuli kuli? Same goes for Pomo. I'm deliberately going out of the traditionally known things to the imagined non-traditional export opportunities in Nigeria. So you go out now, it's a craze, planting chips that somebody even actually has set up a packaging plant somewhere in Maryland in the US, just planting chips. Because everybody out there wants to snack. Here we want to eat. So it's a baaku and everything to fill our tummy. Out there, you want something that keeps you going. Um, I mean, it's more like the joy through this, through that. So you see our cashew nuts, you see our peanuts. These are the areas where I think that we should be concentrating. So if an exporter comes to, or a potential exporter comes to me to ask me which uh, commodity should I buy that will give me the highest profit, I ask him, are you ready to do a homework? then I give them the kind of homework that I've just talked about. But in order also to continue to enjoy pricing premium or premium pricing in export, there are soft issues that the Nigerian exporter is not... Okay, I think uh, we lost. Uh, we lost okay, again. maybe I should continue. Yeah. All right. So I just like to chip hello? in that. So the uh, hello, sir, can you hear me? So let's chip in that the uh, our audience is like our audience. Uh, the audience segment is broad, right? So most of them, like I mentioned earlier, I might not even be familiar with the uh, the the rubrics, the you know technicalities of of agri business. And that's why we're trying to expand so that even the any question right that's going on in the mind of people, right? So we're trying to address these questions in the uh, in this session. Okay. All right. Okay, I think we have him back. Let's have him back instead of telling by then. Okay, so let me quickly uh, reel this out before uh, they kick me out again. I think it has to do with the network. So I'm okay. talking about other things that add a uh, 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 margin to your profit or profitability. Delivery efficiency, for example, trust and credibility, correctness of documentation, as in compliance with every term, uh, comma, and full stop of the contract, understanding what your customer needs at every point in time, and of course, ability to deliver to meet that customer's need in terms of quantity, and quality, all of these things come together to push up your price. As export manager of Stanmark in the 1999 to 2000, um, well, I'm not blowing a trumpet here, but I usually got for my company at least 5%, at least 5% higher price than our competing cocoa processing companies in Nigeria. And what was responsible? Is the same cocoa is from the same Idori and Ecom. But if I told a customer that you will get your container on the 10th of October, if it didn't come, you could be sure that that fault did not come from my company. And you could trace that fault maybe to a delay in the movement of the ship. But on top of that, if I got that information that it was going to be delayed, I took the extra care to phone or telex 
the uh, 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 the importer ahead. Give them a heads up. Sorry, we're going to have an eight-hour delay. Nigerian exporters are not known to go uh, this length. So this, those are the soft things that I think that in addition to the physical uh, uh, aspects of product presentation, packaging, and quality, and all of those, you need to look at them. Your importer must be able to trust you. When I joined the company, they were selling on credit and chasing after a process to be repatriated. Three and a half years later, when I was leaving, my customers were actually paying in advance, knowing fully well that if Stanmark said it's coming, it's coming. And in the world of just-in-time delivery, there is nothing better that you can do for yourself than to ensure that your customer can take you by your word. So you have to be intentional in ensuring that you are not the one at, at the failing end. So add this to the homework that you do. Like I said, my own approach, when I was still actively involved in brokerage, brokerage as in they come and say, can you find a market for this? My own approach, maybe because I have the foundation as a teacher, was to give the person homework, list questions and say, go and go back to your source. Because export is, is not just, can you get me a market? There are various levels. There's the product side. And the product side includes knowing your product, knowing the quantity you have, knowing the seasonality, and knowing uh, alternative sources as to, uh, to be able to aggregate to meet the quantity that is required. Let me give you a story to just round up this uh, uh, part of my contribution. In 2009, no, 2018, I guess, I was in Arkansas, the world headquarters of Walmart. I needed to get them to give me, a, a, what do you call it, import order, so I could be bringing products from Nigeria. Where I live in Canada, in the GTA alone, there are about 3,500 outlets of Walmart. So the global purchasing director asked me, if I ask you to bring peanut, are you able to give me like 100 containers every month? And are you able to ensure uniformity of the nuts in terms of sizes, in terms of color, in terms of taste? And can you do this? over the next 10 years, because the minimum uh, relationship we go into is a sustained delivery over 10 years. So now, if we wanted to boost export from Nigeria, if we cannot answer these questions and answer them convincingly and evidentially, then we will still be on, as far as I'm concerned, Nigeria is still at the level of subsistence exports right now except of course for the multinationals that are using here as an industrial outpost. The micro, medium um, uh, enterprise sector of Nigeria, we are still at the level of subsistence exports. Thanks. Wow. wow. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. The, the uh, uh, Thanks for that because uh, one of the things we've been looking at in this session is the fixing the, the knowledge gap, right? And people to get me from where they are uh, to where uh, they could be, right? When it comes to agribusiness. And thanks for, for that breakdown. And thanks for uh, adding the technicalities to, you know, not just thinking about the, you know, the profit margin alone, but looking at the, like the processes involved. I love how you put in the, uh, talking about the logistics, right? And how that actually factors in into the, you know, the, the cost of production and eventually the, no, the profit, uh, the profit gain you can actually get from business. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, let's go on a short break. Then we're we'll back to discuss more on finance. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. 
So my next question goes to Mr. Yusuf Ogumbi. As again over there at the warehouse. So this question is, is this. So as a young man, right, with a small cash of one million naira, just lying around today, you know, you're not back in account. Which aspects you know, of the logistics and uh, trade value chain can I play in? <laughs> no, it's not similar to the last question, right? And you know, I'm new, I'm a newbie, and I don't get my hands burned, right? <laughs> I can see it's Love and see, okay, you guys, it's back at the same question. <laughs> All right, okay, so for newbies, right? So, <laughs> okay, so you see, it's not like here, right? Okay, so let me just direct this to Mr. Bamdili then. So, for a newbie, right? And <laughs> so, I'm asking to have the young man. So, for the young man, right? So, has only a uh, line in the in a, around and who has what? I said, it was a million era, one million era. Right in you know in one of the bank, bank accounts and you know, we want to go into logistics and, and, and trade value. So which which of the chain, you know, which of the uh uh which of the let me say the, the space where what can he play right to get good returns on his money without losing his cash, right? Because he has limited uh, experience and knowledge when it comes to I'm farm. You should go and farm. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Mr. Abamdele, I think you should be fair. I know for a fact that you operate an export club where people don't have to be the ones going into the market out there. And I know that you are not a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> so you can help the young man by getting him to subscribe to the export club. My second answer to that is that with the help of the UK government, about three years ago, um, again, with um, efforts, sacrificial efforts from well-meaning Nigerians, including Mr. Ayemibo, uh, we have been able to set up a network of practicing non-oil exporters of Nigeria that also encourages export clustering. Remember, I talked about the challenge or the question that was thrown at me uh, at Walmart. So even if I had a hundred million naira, there was never any way that it was going to be enough to satisfy a single order from Walmart. What's the solution? Get 100 people who can each do one container. That's where the people like uh, uh, the person who has that question, who are one million naira, that's where they can play in. But of course, I must caution, this will have to be based on due diligence before you put down your money. If not, it will be like MMM. Oh, bring your one million. Uh, in three months, you can come back. I will give you uh, 1.5 million. In six months, it will be 10 million. No, that's not how export works. So my honest answer is, I think uh, with PISAG and uh, other bodies like you, I think you guys should go ahead and find out a number of uh, uh, people and organizations in Nigeria that can offer export clustering or cooperative exporting so that people can actually collaborate. And then um, in logistics, I think you guys call it groupage, where one person cannot fill a container, he gets um, uh, 10 other people and they pull their efforts together. Thanks. All right. All right, let me now. Um, <laughs> the what is the way they was talking about is the possibility, it's an option actually. But the reason why I say he says friends go and farm was actually because it's like he wants to invest. If like he wants, I'm not sure he wants to export. Because if he wants to export, I would say he should use part of that money to go and learn the business and understand the business. Sincerely, if he learn the business well and understand it well, he should be able to raise money with the remaining he has to be able to work with other people to export. Or, like Isabel Ibe said, working together with others. And I think this, this is, for me, I think this is actually the way to go for us to grow export in Nigeria. 
for, for us to find a way to work together in clusters. All these silos, silos on their own, small, 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 small here, is not going to lead us anywhere. That people will be able to come together and be able to do big transactions together. Else, we won't be able to get that kind of big transaction. So for that person, I would recommend, let him go and use, learn with the money. If he has learned enough, he will be able to raise money with other people to be able to do it together. But if he's looking at investing, then of course, what he said about what we do in terms of investment um, club might be an option for him to do. But I already presume that you want the person, one person wants to do the business, not that he just wants to invest. If you want to do the business, learning, attending a program like this, spending time to learn, maybe online or paying for it, whichever way, but getting that knowledge, I think, is extremely important for us before you even think of doing anything at all. Uh, but at the end of the day, working together because it doesn't have enough, then getting other people to work together and working with an, I mean, an organization like yours, pulling people together, and be able to do this transaction in a secure manner, I think would be a way to deploy that kind of resources. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bamdele. Okay. <laughs> I just get seen, getting more interesting now. So let's go to finance proper, right? And earlier today, we had uh, experts in the agro-finance uh, space. They, uh, they shared their insights on how to you know, source for funding for no, agri uh, uh, business uh, uh, initiatives. But from my own perspective, I like to also learn, right, from my own perspective, because we have consultants, we have people, we have, we have uh, vast experience. So I'm, I'm going to direct this question back to um, Mr. Lufemi. All right, so what are the steps, like, one would take based on your experience, right? What are the steps one would take based on your experience to take, uh, to raise finance for scaling one's business so you've already started you know, you're doing it you know like you mentioned on a sustained basis and you want to take it bigger because you can sense you can see the opportunity in what you're doing so what are the steps you would take right or you advise a young man to take right uh, in the agro logistics and trade sector uh, as to mr lufemi by uh by the Oh, okay. I, I thought he was so Mr. Aimee, but that's why I, I was uh, keeping quiet. Of course, um, a few uh, examples have already been proffered, but I think that we have, I don't know as empirically uh, correct, but I believe that every commercial bank in Nigeria has an export desk. I believe we have a, a Nigeria Export Import Bank. We have Bank of Industry that is also foreign into agricultural lending. But we also have, I wish Mr. Yusuf were still on because Afex also has a way, I mean, a few products. If I remember in my last engagement with them almost nine, 10 years ago, these are the places where one can go for finance. But you want to go looking for finance, you won't go with uh, your mouth that um, uh, I want to go into export. I was told that I need up to 15 million naira. No, you will have, you will need to have a very uh, articulate, well uh, constructed export business plan that's more like a feasibility study that, um, like they say, bankable uh, feasibility report about what uh, uh, you are going to go into, what product, um, where are your potential markets? Have you already started to communicate uh, any evidence of correspondence, any commitment from potential importers to take uh, up your product? These are the uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, documented answers that you will need to take to a Nexim bank, for example. I am aware, and I think if you guys can reach them, I think they're not doing enough in that direction, no indictment intended, but with the number of uh, SME export financing products that Nexim says that it has developed, I think that um, there needs to be ample amplification. But just to be direct in answering your questions, for me, these are 
the sources uh, of export financings that, uh, that are readily available. Of course, with the scarcity of uh, Forex in Nigeria, every bank, every commercial bank wants you to open uh, a, dom a domiciliary account export proceeds only because it also upscales their own performance reports to the Central Bank of Nigeria. And if you look at also the Central Bank, the kinds of uh, um, pronouncements, I don't know about the implementation, but the kinds of pronouncements, I know there is still, it has not been rescinded, there is still the 500 billion naira export stimulation facility that uh, CBN uh, said it was making available uh, in February 2016, that was said, and so much. But okay, let's leave uh, the man who is a friend of all the banks to tell us more about uh, how easy it is to access all of this. But they live at <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm um, sure Mr. Uh, Larry will be wondering how did they, these people, two people, manage to connect with each other on my program. <laughs> uh, that's great. I like to get insights too from Mr. Bandeli. Yeah. Now, um, what I must say is, banks are desperate to finance exports right now, very desperate, and there are financial institutions in Nigeria today that are financing export without asking you for collateral. Without asking for collateral. I mean, tangible collateral. It's been a talk. I mean, it's been um, discussion in the sector for years now about the need for bank to begin to see the need to fund export per transaction, not looking at tangible collateral. And a number of financial institutions are looking at that right now. Some of them are not commercial banks, but a financial institution financing export. And I'm talking about organizations that have recommended at least two of my clients and they finance them without collateral. However, to be able to get those financing, you must have been in the business. So generally, if I'm going to finance you, I want to be sure you are not going to lose the money. And one of the ways you demonstrate that is by showing evidence that you have done it before. Meaning, if you are a newbie, most likely you will get financing from the bank. If you are a newbie, most likely you will not get financing from the bank. And the reason is simple. It will be like you are going to be gambling with the money because you don't have track record of performance. Mm -hmm. You do not have track record of performance. So in order, you know, I give this example that you don't want to go to a bank tomorrow and say you need your money, you want to go and withdraw, and the bank say, oh, sorry, we gave our money to a particular exporter and they could not pay back. You, won't, you don't want to hear that kind of story from any bank. You want to put in your ATM and get the cash. You want to write, do your transfer. You don't want to want to withdraw and someone is telling you stories. So that's why banks also don't want to toy with the money. But what has happened right now is in the Beatles, mellow down collateral they have to now emphasize some other things track credit code of performance evidence of history evidence that you have a transaction you want to do right now like a purchase order from a buyer who you have done business with before so you need those evidences now in sourcing for money i hold the opinion that to get capital you need not just the cash to attract the cash, which is the capital you are looking for, you need credibility, you need character, you need companion or relationship, and you need competence. These four are intangible money that can attract the cash. So if you're able to demonstrate to a financier, be it bank or non-bank, that you are credible, credibility is a track record of performance. You have character, that means there's a consistency of conduct. And this can be traced. For example, if you don't pay your NEPA bill on time or water bill on time, as if there are bills you pay late, it's a sign that you might be a bad debtor. Mm -hmm. Because if payment of loan is an attitude. If you pay your bill regularly, 
most likely you'll pay the loan back also. Because some people have the money, they don't just want to pay. So character becomes important. Then competence. Skill to be able to manage the business becomes very important. But what I would say is that if you have this intangible money and you can demonstrate you have done this business before and you have an order asking you to supply in Nigeria of today, I can get bank for you who will be willing to finance you even if you don't have a tangible collateral. So that brings me back to the issue of you being ready for the financing. You being ready for the financing. You having a product you want to export, you have a purchase order that you want to supply on, you have a good payment tank, you have other partners working with you in the business, other partner meaning you are not the only one. So if you are sick, the business is not going to stop because you are sick. You got the other people. You have issue of doing that previous business. Then more importantly, you must have equity contribution. It's called having a skin in the game. If you're asking me for money, you're asking me for 10 million euro, I want to know how much of your own money is going to be in this business. 2 million, 3 million, 4 million. If you are not going to put your own money, I won't put my money. Why? Ah, if anything goes wrong, you will leave everything and go now because your money is not there. But if your money is there, there is a high chance that you are going to see it through, irrespective of the challenges being faced. So your own contribution in terms of funding then become very, very important. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bamdele. Thank you. Now I'm going to direct the next question to Mr. Alupemi Boyede. And so we're talking now in, in, in financial rights, we're talking about money, the raising funds, and, uh, and the rest. So my question is this, right? So after raising funds, no, many people don't know how to strategically, right, appropriate that the, the funds. So it's not like they they embezzle the funds or they use money for something else, but they're not able to strategically allocate the funds, right, to critical areas of their business. And because of that, the you know, business fails, you know, they go into debt and do stuff. So what would you advise, right? After raising money, you can get money, get the money from BOI or or maybe from private investors or something. So how do you, what do you advise? What are the critical aspect of the uh, business, right? That one needs to appropriate and allocate funds to not to guarantee scale uh, and growth. Thanks so much, Damilari. I think that question was very, very elaborately and uh, aptly answered by Bamidele. There is no, you, there's no, you have no business collecting money if you didn't know what segments and the items of your export business that you are going to allocate it to there is the possibility of force majeure that's the only one that i would say is permitted if at all it is permitted for somebody to say i lost my money in export force majeure um the uh, goods got uh uh, missing or uh, taken to the wrong destination, um, the products got expired uh, because of a delay in the logistics uh, process, like it has happened to me before. I lost uh, close to a hundred and uh, something thousand dollars a few years ago, uh, simply because uh, I had challenges at the Nigerian ports and the products already carry a, a definite shelf life. By the time they arrived at destination, it was difficult to sell because that is permitted. But for God's sake, why approach Bank of Industry if you do not know, for example, that the money I am asking you for is going to cover um, four containers of 22 tons each of cocoa butter? To get my four containers, I would need 100 tons of raw cocoa beans at 100,000 or a million naira per ton. I am going to process at Ileoluji at 25,000 naira per ton. I am going to transport 
from Ondo to Apapa at 15,000 Naira per ton. I am going to load and offload at 5,000 Naira per ton. All of these are specific expenditure items that I think Mr. Lufemi lost his network there. Okay. Let me jump in while we wait for him. All right, sir. Now, um, the question was in terms of allocating resources. You yeah, know, I have a friend. My... I have a friend. He's an exporter. And it's always having an issue with cash flow. Okay, I think Mr. Femi is back. Yeah, so... Uh, like we were talking about uh, the allocation of resources, I listed the things that, of course, your uh, credit request should contain. If they contained that, and your commercial bank or bank of industry or Nexim released a loan to you at that, I mean, based on that particular information that you supplied, and uh, you were traveling to Ondo to go and buy cocoa. You met a friend at uh, uh, Ore who said, ah, uh, somebody ex exported um, charcoal last week. He made 250% uh, profit. And you quickly diverted that to go and double into charcoal that you know nothing about. I think that is called misappropriation. And just as it is uh, uh, ill-advised in government, it is also ill-advised in business. So getting your fingers burnt in that line will first and foremost have to come from you. It is the habit or the personal orientation of the person who is taking a loan that will uh, decide or determine whether he... Uh, uh, he administers the funds according to what they are supposed to be meant for, or if he decides to go and marry a second and third wife, believing that uh, the profit is going to flow in. Um, I just, uh, as an aside, um, I'll give you a practical example. In the year 2000, uh, Ikorodu was still a remote community. The dualization had not yet uh, been completed. It stopped for several years at Owode Oniri. As that community was growing, I mean, exploding, especially immediately after the completion or the commencement of the completion of the dualization, a, fr a few friends and I came together and realized that this community does not have uh, uh, adequate Medicare. And we put our heads together and set up Newgate Hospital. For the first 10 years, the only dividend that we, the investors and owners of Newgate Hospital, the only dividend we took was one bag of rice and four liter uh, um, gallon of vegetable oil every December for Christmas. Every other thing every other profit that uh, we got was plowed back into the business to build it. So it has to be a personal discipline, first and foremost. And then on top of that, you will now look at the technical aspects, the ingredients, the expenditure items, and allocating those expenditures. Again, let me not blame the uh, person. If, for example, you took a loan um, in uh, February this year to go into an export business, and at that time, the dollar was at 430 or 470 Naira, and you have not yet completed the transaction. And today, dollar is at 700. You know what happened to most of the businesses that took the African Development Bank Export Stimulation Loan? AFBESL, they called it in the early 1990s. Most of them went bankrupt because the exchange rate actually meant that they needed to 
they needed much, much more Naira to be able to pay back the dollar denominated loans that they took. Those are understandable that everybody can put on the table. But in the main, running your business, your, I mean, the financial management of your business is actually a matter of personal financial discipline. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Alpenbeide. Thank you very much. Now we we'll go on another short break. When we are back, we entertain questions from you. Welcome back. Our Tinker team has been collecting some of your questions, and our panelists are ready to answer these questions. Okay, so we are doing some of the questions from YouTube and Facebook. All right, so this is from Kabiru Isu. It's a very interesting lecture. It talks so much on exports by ships and plane. Can you come down to local level, like exporting products to African countries, e.g., Cameroon? Chad, thank you. So, I think Sir Bamdeli would like to answer this question. Okay. Well, I didn't get that question. What was the question exactly? So, the question says that. Uh, the, that we talk so much on the exports by ships and, and plane. So can we talk about exporting products to Afghan So what do you want us to talk about it? What do you want us so, to talk about it? That would be about the challenges, right? The challenges and technicalities involved okay, in okay, okay. exporting to... Okay, uh, and the reason why we talk a lot about exporting outside of Africa is because the reality on ground is that there are more exports outside of Africa than within Africa. But uh, Kabiru might be aware of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that is supposed to facilitate the trade within Africa. Uh, trading within Africa can be challenging. I did a shipment to Cote d'Ivoire recently. Uh, I was able to get someone that delivered it in a week afterwards, but the initial person I got that would go by road told me two weeks to three weeks. You know, I mean, these are the challenges because moving by road. And because if you go by sea, sometimes it will leave from Lagos to maybe a country in Europe before coming back. Uh, but that's been worked on now. Uh, uh, there is a, an arrangement to ensure uh, trading is done within Africa. In fact, I'm aware of uh, there's a sealing link project that I we're hoping will be will be launched. The last program we had with Nexim Bank, Nexim was confirming that the program, the service will most likely be launched before the end of this year to enable shipment by sea to West African countries. Shipping by road is not very efficient in terms of cost right now. Delay at the border, um, uh, damage to goods. I mean, so many issues keeping by road, particularly when you don't have control over the truck. Some I have been able to do well, but look at their prices are very high. But shipping by sea might be able to be a, a reality from next year. And that will help to be able to take advantage of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. But the reason why the conversation has not been so much about Africa is because the reality is the inter African trade is very low. Now 16, 17, 18 percent. Uh, we do a lot of trade with other African, with other countries outside of Africa, down within Africa. I don't think Nigerian trade with Africa is up to 12 percent or 13 percent of total trade. There are Nigerians doing terms of export, and that probably is the reason why that is not happening. I think Mr. Boye didn't want to say something about that. No, I was only indicating that uh, intra African trade is actually as an abysmal. Uh, four to five percent, and then I will also. Uh, I'm not a, a, a prophet of doom, but I can tell you for a fact because I am currently coordinating on behalf of uh, Nigeria Export Promotion Council and SMIDAN a an exhibition of uh, uh, Nigerian products and services in Gambia that we hold. Uh, early next month, 12th to 20th of October. And when we went for the fact-finding uh, uh, trip um, just late last month to Banjul, 
the people trading Nigerian products actually in the markets there have told us directly that it takes 90 days for them to receive goods that they bought from Lagos in Banjul. Of course, the challenges are as enunciated by Mr. Ayemibo. Trade infrastructure within the African continent is poor. This will be resolved, hopefully, at the political level. At the economic level, and to answer that uh, question directly, you probably want to think twice if you want your shipments to be done by road because of the several uh, bottlenecks that are still, most of them man-made actually, that are still there in, in Taboda, across border, among the neighboring West African countries. However, there's a solution. The current administration at the Nigeria Export Promotion Council evolved the ETH, Export Trading House uh, model, that is supposed to help so instead of individual um, nano or micro enterprises trying to brave the odds, you will get, and uh, the company that uh, I know now that is operating in West Africa is Nexport Trade. Nexport Trade Limited is the export trading house that has opened uh, a warehouse recently that was commissioned by the NEPC in Lome, Togo, and that has its uh, plans to also open similar uh, outlets in other West African countries. So how does this affect you as the body of a uh, newbie exporter? All you simply need to do is to look for next portrait, give them the address of where you want your delivered, take it to the next portrait, reception depot here in Nigeria, somewhere in Lagos, I don't know where, and they will handle the logistics of getting your goods there definitely on time. Mr. Emibo, I'm not too sure that C-Link is going to come up even at the end of 2023. I stand to be corrected. Wow. I wow. was privileged to be part of the initial launch of C-Link in Accra more than 12 years ago. Wow. Yes, that's when it was officially launched and adopted. OK, we, we lost. OK, uh, I think um, Mr. Bede lost his connection there. OK, so I think we'll move on to the next question from the audience. OK, so this directed to Mr. Aimbo from Eduja John. So you mentioned that one should seek knowledge first before going into the value chain. Please, can you tell us genuine locations where one can learn about agrologistics and trade? Um, we, we actually run a program in conjunction with American Institute of Extended Studies. Uh, it's a diploma in export business management. I would recommend that strongly. It's a very rigorous and highly comprehensive program that will give you all the information you need to be able to um, get started so that at least you are starting on the right footing as a result of the information you've been able to gather. So I would strongly recommend you consider the Diploma in Export Business Management from the American Institute of Extended Studies. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Amy Bo. Okay, before we address the next question, can we go on a short break? before we address the next question from the audience. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, all right. Now I want to ask, uh, like I rightly mentioned earlier that the like our audience, right, those are watching us, the, they are from diverse backgrounds, right? diverse backgrounds. Some are not even in, in agriculture, but they are looking to agriculture because of the uh, conversation and everything surrounding agriculture today. Now, uh, my question now goes to Mr. Back to Mr. Bambili. <laughs> is Bambili are you involved? The question is, now, based on experience, right, do you think that access to funding, access to money, do you think is a serious 
challenge because that's the perception, right? Even in misconception. You think it's a serious challenge, right? To get in, into the agro logistics and trade business. Do you think it's a real yes. challenge? It's a challenge. It is a challenge. But the landscape is changing. You know, the reason why our banks were not very keen on financing export and putting a lot of clog in the wheel, asking for all sorts of things before was the adoption of making money. We were making a lot of money from import. But today, the import business is down because they don't have enough foreign exchange to be able to fund import transactions. So most of them now need to creatively fund export to be able to bring in foreign exchange and be able to deploy to fund their ex-import transaction. So now you see bank being a bit more flexible in the requirement, are willing to take a higher level of risk more than they've been taking before, just because they are desperate for those funds. So it is a challenge. So on one hand, banks were not willing to fund. On the other hand, the people also were not knowledgeable enough to know exactly what to do to get the funding. So you need to understand the fact that if you are going to get money from banks, number one, banks give you money when they know you don't need it. And what I mean <laughs> is that... <laughs> what I mean is that you won't be desperate. You, you know, there's a way you position yourself. You are not like calling their blog, if you like. If you, so when you, are, when, when you want to take money from a bank, you should be talking to three, four banks at the same time. Don't talk to one. So that when one is messing or you're telling him that, look, I'm talking to this bank, they're already willing to give me. I'm talking to this bank. You know, like you're talking to three, four banks, and the, all of them are talking to you. You put yourself at an advantage. Because when you know you are the one, you feel nobody's giving you money. You are coming to us. Why should we? But when two, three people are talking to you, maybe they come to your office, they have to wait because you're in a meeting with another bank. Ah, they want to have a share of your business. In fact, let me tell you in Nigeria, there are some banks in Nigeria if they give you loan, if you go to some other bank, if they know you have a loan with that bank, they will want to give you. Just because some poor man are giving you money. Why? They know that bank must have done their due diligence before they give you money. So they will not even do so much again because they know what other bank will have done. So when they know you don't need it, not need it in the sense that you are not showing desperation, you are showing them you have options. If they choose not to give you, then you stand a chance to get it. But knowledge, number one, don't go to a bank to give you money when you don't want to contribute to part of it. Don't go to a bank to give you money when you don't have something you are deploying the money to. Don't go to a bank to give you money when you have not demonstrated that you have history, you have done that business before. But what I know in the sector today is banks are desperate to give money. But they also want to give money so a business that will bring back the money. You can be sure collateral, which is a major issue before, is now they look for soft collaterals. They can afford to give you loan without collateral. And I mean tangible collateral, having a house, having this, that. But can use the goods as collateral now. Why are they doing all that? Which is what they should have been doing before. But some of them were not doing it. They will say, ask you to go and get this, go and get that. But now they need foreign exchange. So I can assure you today, oh, banks are more willing to give loan, but you also must be ready. And you need information to learn on what they need in order to be able to get yourself ready uh, for the financing. Thank you. All right. Thank Mr. You Ibo, banks were doing warrant, uh, warehouse warrant refinancing until Nigerians found a devious way of refinancing the same product with uh, five different banks. So as soon as the banks started getting their fingers crossed, uh, burnt, they stopped. Yeah. They stopped. So again, the issue of credibility, but I think that this has to be a topic for discussion another day. I think yeah, uh, uh, credibility as part of uh, the requirement for success in international trade is an issue that is not being given uh, deserved attention in this part of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Boyde. Thank you, Mr. Ayemi Bo. It has truly been an insightful session, a huge one. 
a lot of nuggets have been shared uh this session and personally i would love to continue with this session i know our audience will love to continue the session but time time is always the factor so thank you very much to our audience thank you for listening and this will bring an end to the session on agro logistics and trade There's a story to be told, a future to behold. There is more to who we are than what they hear. We have love within our soul, fire in our bones. We've got everything it takes to make it here. There's much more within our soil, more than just our oil. We can grow the food to feed the whole world square. Culture is the key, there's treasure in the trees. The time is now, the land is green, wealth is here.